my speaker today is actually going to do a two-part presentation or a short talk. He went a little prelude to his main talk. Let me tell you a little bit something about him. Uh, he's our former lost treasurer and he's a rockabilly legend. He worked for 36 years at General Motors as a vehicle development engineer manager, specializing in acoustics, noise, and vibration. He retired in 1999. He graduated from the University of Michigan in 1960 with a degree in engineering physics and spent two years as an officer in the U.S. Army in Germany. In his spare time, he wrote and recorded music for Epic and Roulette Records as one of the ski brothers. Jim's astronomical interests include observation and outreach. He owns several telescopes, but in recent years, his passion for astronomical history and technology has become a major factor. He's a member of the Van Helpert Astronomical Society and has visited a number of major observatories. Uh, tonight, this presentation will concentrate on the post tail period from 1949 until the present, and he will discuss the trials, tribulations, politics and personalities which had to be overcome along with significant technological advances which resulted in the current and near future generation of giant telescopes. Jim Shedlowski will review the, these huge instruments and the technologies that make them tick. Uh, with all due respect and let's welcome Mr. Jim Shedlowski. Prefaces by saying that I started on this uh, uh, started this presentation six or eight months ago, and about four months ago, I, I realized it was going to be too long. I tried to get it shorter, but then I called Mark and asked him if I could have a short presentation, which is a kind of a preview of the rest of it. So you'll see. <coughs> okay, you might want that microphone close to your mouth. Yeah. Can you hear me back there? Yes. yes. I'll try to speak up. I don't want to get too close and get to boom. But, uh, okay, if I can find my mouse there, which I lost a few moments ago, by the way. It's kind of uh, I might have it here. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my annual September Cranbrook production. I hope you'll enjoy the material I'll cover tonight as much as I did in researching its content. I learned a lot about the new generation of giant telescopes and some interesting history on how they evolved. I hope to share some of that with you tonight. I'd like to begin with a quote from one of the several books involved with my research, an excellent read called Starlight Detectives by Alan Hirschfield. It reads, quote, in 1894, William Hale, George Ellery Hale's father, ordered a 60-inch mirror blank from the Saint-Gobain foundry in France. More than a decade later, the great mirror rose from its crypt in Wisconsin at the Yerkes Observatory, and in 1908, found itself facing skyward on an airy mountaintop in California at Mount Wilson. The era of modern mega-reflectors was about to begin. End of quote. This event marked a milestone and a turning point in the history of astronomy and astronomic instruments, but it was preceded and in fact enabled by a number of other milestones along the way and was followed by other very significant developments throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. My presentation will mention a number of these steps along the pathway to today's and tomorrow's giant telescopes. I have elected to partition this presentation as shown in the following outline. <clears throat> I will first briefly cover the early history of the telescope from Galileo's one and an eighth inch refractor to Crossley's 36 inch reflector, whose gift to the Lick Observatory essentially marked the beginning of the end of the dominance of, of the professional refractor. This review will touch on many technical factors which influenced the telescope's design during this extended period of positional astronomy. Secondly, we will we'll examine the extraordinary life and times of George Ellery Hale and his influence on transforming the nature of astronomy to incorporate cosmology and thereby requiring ever larger telescopes. 
Next, I'll discuss the 30-year period following the dedication of the 200-inch hail at Mount Palomar, during which no comparable instrument was built, but which saw the development of the political, institutional, and importantly, the technological infrastructure for the reawakening of large telescope projects. The next section will describe the somewhat fortuitous circumstances which surrounded the creation of the multiple mirror telescope on Mount Hopkins in Arizona and how it brought about a rethinking of the potential for larger telescopes at a more modest price tag, which resulted some years later in the Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea, the first of the modern giant telescopes. I'll next review the factors required to build and operate an observatory with a giant telescope, followed by the pros and cons of the several technologies and processes for producing the heart of these telescopes, the primary mirror. I will then conclude with a synopsis of the 16 existing telescopes with effective apertures larger than the 200-inch hail at Mount Palomar, and finally, the several even larger instruments scheduled to come online in the near future. Let us begin at the beginning, and first examine the earliest of telescopes, the basic refractor. As Galileo and his contemporaries soon found out, in order to produce a more powerful instrument to gather more light and resolve finer detail, they needed a larger objective lens, which introduced a significant amount of chromatic aberration, or color distortion. Telescope makers from that era discovered that a solution to that problem was to increase the length, and thus the length of the telescope, the focal length and the length of the telescope. Doubling the diameter of the objective, however, meant that the focal length had to be increased by four times, or the focal length squared, to achieve the same amount of minimal chromatic aberration, which resulted in very ungainly and difficult to use instruments. Some of these giant scopes reached lengths of 300 or 600 feet. Finally, in 1757, John Dolan patented the achromatic objective lens, which greatly reduced chromatic aberration. Followed in 1763 by the apochromatic lens system, milestones which further reduced this problem, and this, along with improvements in glass technology and more precise fabrication, brought the refractor into its golden age for nearly a century and a half. Meanwhile, Sir Isaac Newton and others contemplating the significant dif difficulties in dealing with the early refractors suggested an alternative, the reflector, whereby the objective lens would be replaced with a mirror shaped in such a manner as to eliminate chromatic aberration altogether. Newton's version, henceforth known as the Newtonian, was the first to be built successfully by him in 1668. Despite the theoretical advantage of the reflector design, the difficulty of construction and the poor performance of the speculum metal mirrors used at that time meant that it took over 100 years for this revolutionary milestone design to compete with the improved refractors. But with a few exceptions, notably John Herschel's 19 and 48 inches, and of course Lord Ross's 72 inch speculum mirror reflectors, the increasingly refined and perfected refractors continued to dominate the era of positional astronomy, which held sway into the late 19th century. And then in 1857, Leon Foucault developed the silver glass mirror, which was lighter by three to five times and more reflective by nine, from 90% to 65% and more durable than the speculum metal mirrors that had been used up to that point. This development occurring concurrently with the emergence of spectroscopy and photography, both of which were favored by the basic design aspects of reflectors, set the stage for the re-emergence of the reflector, another milestone toward giant telescopes. Up to this point, the middle of the 19th century, the science of astronomy had been mostly directed at ever more precise characterization of the positions and the movements of heavenly bodies for timekeeping, navigation, and predictive purposes, exclusively conducted by direct observational methods. 
This positional astronomy era was to at first gradually and then rapidly morph into the investigation of the physical nature of heavenly bodies and the origin and structure of the universe, cosmology or astrophysics. This revolution was enabled by the development of two milestone technologies during that period, photography and spectroscopy, both of which had a major impact on the design criteria for telescopes. The potentials for photography and astronomy were quickly grasped by the serious amateurs of the day, who played a large role in developing the necessary photographic instruments, photographic requirements, that is, shorter exposure times and handleability, and marrying them to improvements in telescope design, such as stable, accurately tracking mounts and improved larger optics. The rapid increase in film speed and improvements in telescope and mounting design led in steps to this amazing 1888 photo of M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, shown in the lower right of the slide by Isaac Roberts using a 20-inch silver glass reflector built specifically for astrophotography and ushered in what I have dubbed the quote, photon collecting age of astronomy. While photography enabled the ability to accumulate and permanently store photons, it was another milestone technology, spectroscopy, pioneered in the 1850s by Kirchhoff and Bunsen that permitted it to be analyzed in various manners. This technology, the application of which was in turn enabled by photography, allowed astronomers to, to examine for the first time the physical and dynamic properties of celestial objects and set the stage for the next phase in our journey to giant telescopes, which will be the long presentation. So, I'll pick this up in a few moments uh, at step two in my outline. We'll see you in a bit. Excellent.